So we're going to get into our, our uh, second keynote of the day, our afternoon keynote. And here joining us is Sarah Vasilov. So Sarah is a UX professional. She's an author. And she's now recently a UX designer at CloudBee. So give it up for Sarah. Hey. Thank you. Thank you. How's everybody feeling? Are you all sleepy after lunch? It's OK. You can take a nap. It's all good. You won't hurt my feelings. So when I was first asked to speak or approached about speaking at this conference, I was like, really? Me? And I know you're probably thinking that too. You're like, what the heck is this chick doing up here? I mean, I've worked on DevOps tools like GitLab and now Jenkins. Uh, Jenkins X is, is the product that I'm on at CloudBees. And I've spent my fair share time of developing for the front end with Git, automation tools, kind of as part of my day-to-day -day work. But I'm definitely not a DevOps engineer. I am most certainly a user experience designer. I'm sure you could tell. But then I started to think about it a little bit. And I was like, yeah, you know, having worked in this industry for <clears throat> 15 years or so, shh. Um, I realize that there's really not that much of a difference between what I do and what all of you do. I'm going to prove it to you. So if you look at the goal, oh, oh I, I got to remember to keep up. So everyone, keep me on point. If I'm talking and it doesn't match, it's because I forgot my clicker. I have a little bit of a disconnect going here. So if you look at the goal of DevOps, Aside from the specifics of the technology space, DevOps is fundamentally a set of practices intended to shorten the system development life cycle while fe delivering features, fixes, and updates frequently in close alignment with business objectives. Does that describe what you do? Basically, mostly. So if you look at what I do, User experience design is a process of enhancing user satisfaction by improving the usability, accessibility, and desirability of a product while aligning with business objectives. And this is a little bit of what I do. There's a lot more to it, and I suspect there's a lot more to what you do, too. So if you look at these two definitions, what jumps out to me is that a large part of DevOps is to deliver features, fixes, and updates. While these deliveries are aligned with business objectives, they are geared towards solving problems for an end user. Much of what I do as an experienced designer is to deliver features, fixes, and updates that enhances a user's experience with a product. And sometimes that user, for me, is actually the people I work with. It really depends on the product I'm working on, and probably for you as well. And if I look at the skills needed to be a DevOps engineer and the skills needed to be a UX designer, I think the similarities are pretty clear. They're really, really close. I think there's some differences in technologies, but other than that, there's a lot of overlap. And even the agile principles that govern our work are the same. If I didn't know any better, I would think that this was a design manifesto. This is exactly what we follow for every sprint, for every project that we work on. And so since there's so much overlap between what you do and what I do, I thought it would be helpful to share one of the problems that I help solve at GitLab for engineers just like you. So as always, I'm going to start with a problem. Maintaining simple, intuitive navigation for products as they scale is a constant challenge. As features are added and the product becomes more and more complex, making sure that users have easy access to the features they need gets more and more difficult. With the implementation of features to support CI, CD, and Auto DevOps, GitLab was experiencing an ever-broadening user base. We went from being just for developers using Git, making sure they had their repositories and they were sharing different projects, to an end-to-end -end life cycle from, from project uh, idea, ideation, development, all the way into automation and deployment. And we were facing a serious navigation problem. So the question for us was, how do you show different types of users what they need to see when they need to see it? How do you give them access to X number of features without overwhelming them and making them just run away screaming? 
And even more challenging is how do you make these changes to an existing product without alienating your user base, particularly a user base that hangs out on Hacker News all day? You know who I'm talking about. In the 9.0 release of GitLab, we took a risk by trying to improve our navigation before having a chance to really thoroughly test it with our users. As an open source project uh, for a software development tool with a diverse user base, the feedback we get is big and it's instant. And the impact of this change was felt and heard immediately. Rather than respond reactively, we decided to use an iterative reset, UX research process to gain deeper insight and understanding of our users' needs. And this process ultimately led to a complete change in the way that we worked as a design and development uh, team at GitLab, as well as the way our users actually navigated within GitLab. So let's take a step back. At GitLab, we work iteratively with a release going out every month. And in version 8.17, which you see here, GitLab users had two ways of navigating, globally and contextually. So users could browse between groups and projects on the left sidebar that you, you see there, and it was static, it was always there. But once you were within a project or a group, your on-page navigation up at the top would change. So you had your contextual navigation at the top, your static global navigation at the side. And this sidebar was a sore spot for many of our core users. You can see we have dueling menus. Often the same thing was repeated in the contextual menu as the global. And it wasn't really the same thing. It was project and projects. It was group and groups. But that little bit of difference was confusing and difficult to see right off the bat. And for users whose primary focus was code review, they didn't need to switch very much. So this sidebar was taking up space unnecessarily for them. So originally, we allowed users to pin or unpin this sidebar. So pinning kept the sidebar in place. So for those that were navigating a lot between projects and groups, they always had that there. It was their, their anchor. It was where they could go. But if you didn't need it there, if you were just working in code review and you wanted to maximize the space on the screen, you could pin it, unpin it, and it would go up into a hamburger menu. And a lot of our users really loved this feature. They were like, make the whole thing this. Just put it all in a hamburger menu. It's perfect. We love it. And much of GitLab was focused on code review. We didn't do a lot of switching because we were working on our own product. We were within the same project day in and day out. So we were like, yeah, let's just do it. So we did it. There was little quantitative data to support this. So we didn't have tracking tools that were able to tell us how many people were actually interacting with that sidebar before we went ahead and put it in a hamburger menu. So we're really going on qualitative data and anecdotal data, right? What we were experiencing and what we heard from the mo most vocal users out there. And I think the push really occurred for, for three distinct reasons. Uh, users said they wanted more space. It was thought that by removing that sidebar, we could get rid of that confusion, right? Remember, we had that confusion between group and groups and project and projects. And by not having that sidebar always there on the page, it allowed us to kind of maybe separate that out and make it easier to navigate. And maybe most importantly, it also meant eliminating a 1,000 plus lines of code to maintain the pinned and unpinned sidebars. So there were some real reasons to do this. They just weren't the right reasons. I wish you could see these, because this is actual screenshots of user reactions to this change. It was bad, and it was immediate. Um, and I, I'll make this available. I, I urge you, please, zoom in and take a look, because it is gold. Um, by addressing just some of the problems that we'd identified, we'd actually made the situation worse, um, because we didn't address the broader information architecture issues that were, were actually causing this problem. And with the amount of negative feedback that we got, we really seriously considered just reverting. But I think that would have been a mistake, and I'm glad that we didn't. Listening to what users said they wanted was what had gotten us into this predicament in the first place, right? So we didn't do that. 
So at this time in GitLab's UX history, UX research was really in its infancy. We just had one researcher. And while everybody was scrambling to, to make this change and get everything stuck up into a hamburger menu, she was uh, going ahead and doing uh, user testing on the old menu. So she wanted to make sure that we had a baseline before we made that change. And she actually did user testing where she had users watch, walk through, we videoed it, and we had all this information on the type of difficulties they were having before we made the change. And I will say that at this time there wasn't a lot of, it wasn't that there wasn't support, but there wasn't a lot of widespread understanding, I think, and appreciation for what UX research could actually add to the development process. So rather than revert, we went back to this user testing that she had been doing. In these initial tests, there were six participants with a variety of job titles and experience. So some were using it for private projects, some were using it on a professional level. So we really wanted to make sure that we were getting all the, this whole spectrum of users that were interacting with our product. And the moderated user testing revealed significant problems with the overall information architecture Results showed that users had a difficulty, one, understanding where they were. They really just didn't know where they were at any given time within the application. That sidebar nav navigation competed with the on-page navigation for the user's attention. They, when they tried to make a decision of where to go, they were, they were toggling between the two trying to figure it out. And those similarities made it hard to distinguish one from the other. And I have links to all the research data here. It's all open source, so you can actually watch these videos. So at GitLab, all work is done in issues. If there's an idea for a feature, an improvement, you place it in an issue and it gets discussed by product, UX, engineering, and our users. So everybody is always part of that conversation. So we started by creating individual issues for each of the problems that we found in that initial testing. And the team worked through the problem and addressed the feedback that we were getting from engineers, product, and users on each one of those issues. Rather than trying to tackle it all together, separating those things out. So these solutions on each of these individual issues were then gathered together to create a single prototype for a second round of moderated user testing. This prototype included the hamburger menu design, so we didn't change that. We wanted to make sure that we were just making small changes that we could measure and compare to what we had from before. So in round two, we had six new participants and they were tested on icon recognition and given a series of tasks to perform to see how well they could do. And I will note that the icon recognition was because we had added, we'd taken some things out of the menu and added them to the top right in kind of a personal navigation area. So you'd have your avatar, you'd have your notifications for to-dos and things like that. So we wanted to see if that made sense to people, if that resonated with them. So from the second round of testing, we were able to hone in on what had improved, what had stayed the same, and what we'd actually made worse. Because that's one of those things is you try to make things better, but inevitably you're probably going to make one or two things worse. So the high level issues we identified was that overall, users felt that the interface looked like a tablet or a mobile device. Well, yeah, I mean, if you're on a screen that's, you know, two monitors wide and all you have is a tiny hamburger menu, it does feel a little bit strange. And then users were still struggling to identify their location. So taking that sidebar and moving it into that hamburger menu hadn't fixed that problem at all. So in this round, though, users were much more successful in finding their My Projects, and they understood a little bit more about what those icons were for. So it looked like we had done a couple of things right, a couple of things wrong. So just as before, we took all of these finding, findings and we prioritized them using issues. So this is actually uh, our usability issues and recommendations, and we just prioritized from, from what we felt was the most uh, important and was also going to provide the most kind of bang for the buck, right? You, you fix this and you're going to help a lot of people, or you fix this and you help two people. And then we created issues based off of these findings. So again, one issue for each of our findings and we built more prototypes. So this time we built prototypes uh, using Framer, and we really started to change the way that we were looking at things. We built two, so we couldn't decide what we wanted to do. <laughs> there were two kind of competing ideas. So you can see in prototype A, the contextual navigation is now in that sidebar. 
It's there on the left. And yes, we brought the sidebar back. There's just too much information to try to cram it all up in the top. There has to be some other space for users to interact with that. We have breadcrumbs up above that contextual navigation, and then your global navigation is at the top, which I think is pretty expected, right? You kind of expect your global navigation to be at the top of the screen. That's kind of your anchor. And then our, the right-hand side there is your personal navigation. And then in prototype B, we took those breadcrumbs and we moved them up into the top. So that's kind of the only difference, is that breadcrumb placement between the two. So again, we went back. Six users, to, six users for each prototype, so 12 total. Walked them through, and we were able to identify additional issues. Um, so in both, they were slow to use the icons, so we'd ask them to go to their to-dos, which they could do by simply clicking on the to-do icon. Many of them didn't do that. Um, that we'd ask them to look for a merge request, which they could do by simply clicking on a merge request icon. Many of them didn't do that. And then users rarely interacted with the breadcrumbs. Um, pretty much it was as if they didn't exist at all in both locations. Whether it was on top or it was in that menu, they had no idea it was there. Or maybe they did and they just didn't care. And one user was still a little bit confused about where they were, but there was a big improvement in terms of overall knowledge and understanding of where they were within the navigation. So no user has complained that it looked like a tablet or a mobile device, so we call that a win. Um, and we added tooltips to the icons to make them a little bit more understandable, and I think that also helped. And while only one user was confused about where he was, the rest of the users uh, were able to navigate the interface, and we felt like that was a big improvement over what we'd had before. So at a, per a certain point in usability testing, you're going to just start seeing the same behavior over and over again. Essentially, you're gonna be getting the same results. Once this happens, testing with more users isn't gonna give you any new knowledge. You're not gonna gain anything by doing that. You're just gonna be wasting your time in theirs. So it's time to actually implement the solutions based on this feedback and then retest with different users. But at this stage, we've been through three rounds of usability testing with 24 users in total. And we felt comfortable that we could actually share this navigation with a much wider audience to, to hasten kind of this, this feedback loop. But we didn't want to just drop it on everybody and say, this is your new navigation, especially after what happened last time. So we decided that we're going to introduce this under a feature flag and allow users to turn it on, take it for a spin, and actually have an issue dedicated to their feedback on this new navigation. So that included asking them to answer some simple questions about how they use GitLab. Are they using it for personal projects? They're using it at work. Um, give us some insight into, into what their feedback is. Um, and then, obviously, go ahead and dump on us. Let us know what works and let us know what doesn't. So this is what we actually put under feature flag in the 9.4 release. And you can see it looks very different from the prototypes. So even from the prototypes to here, we made a lot of changes. Um, overall, the, the placement of the contextual, global, and personal navigation remain the same, right? Contextual on the side, global on the top, and personal on the far right. But we'd seen a lot of issues with the breadcrumbs. And so we decided uh, to go with the boring solution and put breadcrumbs where you'd expect to see them, at the top of the page. We felt that this version was a drastic improvement, um, especially for contrast and separation. Adding a little bit of color to anchor that global navigation at the top really made a big difference between those two menus. It also gave us the opportunity to add some more color and life into the interface. And people really liked it. These are true. These are real, real fan reviews. <laughs> Um, the results were overwhelmingly positive. Most users found that the new navigation was easier to use and they welcomed the change. And again, remember, this was not rolled out to everyone. This was rolled out to anyone that wanted to go ahead and switch it on and take it for a spin. But as always, there were some things that we really needed to work out. So some users were really quick to say, this looks exactly the same as the old navigation, right? And it kind of does, like I get it, it does, if you just look at it and you don't actually interact with it. So without diving in and playing around with it, I think you, you could easily say, hey, these look exactly the same. But while they're aesthetically similar, the information architecture is completely different. 
So the global and personal navigations in 9.4 were firmly anchored at the top of the screen, and that left everything on screen contextual, related to where you were at any given time. And they hated the purple. Oh my God, I've never heard so many people complain about purple in my life. Um, they really hated it. <laughs> So in the original menu, users had the ability to set the color of menu on a project-by-project -project basis, which was really helpful, right? Because you can have one project be green, one be blue, have 20 different tabs, which I know you all are doing, and be able to go between them. And so we allowed people to use different colors as a way to quickly know which project they were in. And during this, uh, during this feedback iteration phase, we implemented several theme options, we made changes to breadcrumbs, we were continually over the next three months rolling out changes that users were suggesting. So we iterated on this, this real world feedback for two to three months. I, I have two months here, but I think it was more like three. And then in the 10.0, we released it as the default way to navigate. So no longer was it something that you'd set in your preferences and turn on and play around with, you had to use it. It was the only way to navigate. The response continued to be positive, and it really did mark a new beginning for us at GitLab in terms of the UX research process. So I think there were some important takeaways for us in this whole process. First and foremost, don't ever rely on what users say that they do. Don't just ask them and then take what they say as truth. People lie. They don't mean to. They're not trying to lie to you. They really do think that's what they're doing or what they want or how they interact with something. But you have to watch what they do. So having user research to back up your decisions is key to keep you from second guessing yourself, right? Especially at a place like GitLab where there are a lot of really vocal users, they're passionate, they love the product, they feel, it's, they have a personal investment in it. And then you go and you change something and it's very upsetting. And as a designer and a developer, it can be really easy to be like, oh wow, maybe we made a mistake. Maybe we should change it. But if you have solid data to back up those decisions, it's a lot easier to stand your ground. And it's a lot easier to explain to them why it's better. And it was really helpful for us to break all of these problems down into individual issues. Rather than trying to tackle it all at once, which is overwhelming and often difficult to really parse as a group, everybody was concentrated on one particular issue in one particular area and then cross-referencing across and bringing it all together. It allowed us to really work a lot more rapidly as well because we had one person working on breadcrumbs. That was all they were working on was how to get those breadcrumbs working. We had another person just working on the navigation color theme, like how are we going to implement that? Another person just working on the uh, overlays and how the focus states work on that side menu. Having that dedicated time allowed us to really go deep. And then progressive disclosure. So first working on it internally and making sure that as many people saw it as possible, inside and outside of the organization. Then putting it behind a feature flag and allowing users to play around with it. And then making it the default. All of these things allowed us to iterate and fix things quickly using feedback from people that use it on a daily basis. And I think Overall, the value of UX research is much more widely recognized at GitLab than it was when that project had started. The rounds of testing and the changes in the user attitude um, prove to the team that user research is worth the time and effort. It also helped us grow closer to product and grow closer to the engineering teams because we were all invested in making this better. We were all a part of this process. In no way was UX a blocker or was this a waterfall process where we were designing it and then just handing it off? Or vice versa, product wasn't telling us what to do and then just handing it off as if we were consultants. We were truly all deeply invested in this process together. And we were able to actually establish a process that was malleable enough um, to work on large projects like a navigation redesign or something small like adding uh, a new icon to our pipeline display. So this is what we came up with and what worked for us. And I think it's 
pretty common. It's, it's kind of the traditional design thinking model of ideation, or actually of discovery, ideation, prototyping, and then analyzing, right? But in here, we use moderated testing, surveys, issues. It really depends on what it is that you're trying to do, what method of user research you're going to use. Uh, usability testing isn't always necessary. Sometimes you can use issues um, and just get feedback. Or sometimes you can send out surveys. Sometimes you do tree testing. It just depends. And then having everybody in the issues and working on sketch designs and then getting it very quickly into a prototype and making sure that we continue to test with that and iterate on all the findings that we get. So I hope that hearing about this problem and the way we went about solving it has been helpful to you. Uh, most importantly, I hope you see that you don't have to have a UX researcher or even be a UX designer to apply the techniques that we've used. Um, simply talking to your users and peers uh, can provide a wealth of insight to you on how to improve your product. Uh, you can call me an optimist, although not many people do, <laughs> but I really do believe that designers uh, and engineers aren't very different from one another. Um, we're both delivering value to the end user while getting tangible results for our organization's business. Now, I purposefully left this a little short because I'd love to answer questions and talk to anybody in the audience who's interested in maybe what I do and my experience with uh, design for DevOps. Are there any questions? Do we have a, a mic? Ah, thank you. I also knew it was after lunch, so I don't want to talk to you for 40 minutes. That's just cruel. It's not Hi. right. Um, wow, that's pretty loud. It is. Uh, the question mainly is, you know, for uh, developers and DevOps, the tools keeps changing almost in a weekly basis, right? Yeah. So how is that process in the design world? It's the same. Uh, that is our pain right now. So um, I, I don't know how, how familiar everyone is with, with the kind of arms race that's happening in the design world, but you've got Sketch. You have Adobe XD, which is, um, I thought Adobe was dead. This is being recorded, oh no. I love you, Adobe. Uh, but I really, I haven't used it in so long for what I do on a daily basis because it was really print-based and Sketch really upped the game. But I've heard that they're doing amazing things with XD. And then we have the issue of, of version control, right? Um, I started out really um, very much in the front-end development world. So when I kind of delved deeper into the design world, it was shocking to me that designers were just saving things out as like, you know, version number 5.765, I hate my life. I mean, it literally was just this long uh, version after version after version. So now Abstract, Percy, um, Figma, there's all these tools coming up. And what they're also trying to do is bring together that collaboration, which I think is a really important bridge between people like me and you, because now you can have a tool like Abstract where I go ahead and I I, you have an issue that you're working on with me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to design it and say you're going to put it out into the world. And I'm going to go ahead and put that together, and then I'm going to share that abstract with you, and you can make comments right there. And you can drop pins and say, hey, what the heck is, I don't know what font this is. Is this part of our normal you know, font base? What is this? What is this? And we can have that back and forth. Um, so there's a lot of things that are changing. The difficult part is, as a team, one, you have your design team, but then you have your broader team. Oh, okay. I thought he was telling me to get off stage. I was like, I'm out. See you later, people. Uh, <laughs> we're good. So yeah, it's a really, it's, did that answer your question or did I go off on a tangent there? No, no, I think it's Okay. Yeah. I mean, how are you handling it? I'm really curious. Like, how, how do you feel? I'm selfishly going to use you now for some user testing, but you know, I'm curious. What do you work with on a daily basis? What do you see changing? Um, so I mostly work with open source Kubernetes and Istio, so my experience probably is a lot different than a lot of the people. Uh, but so our experience comes from the testing we do. It literally comes from the issues that are open and running the test on the entire suite we have. Uh, but curious to know also that you're saying testing with like real people, like six people, you did for GitLab. Um, but GitLab probably have thousands or hundreds of thousands of users, right? So yes. how are you saying that this six people's experience kind of scale up to all the people that are going to use the product, right? That's a really good question. I can tell you're a skeptic. 
<laughs> no, that, that's the nature of the business, right? I, you, you, it is. It is. I'm a skeptic too. Um, it's funny if you look into a lot. There's a, there's a, a lot of thoughts back and forth about that. Of like five people isn't possibly enough. Um, but what I will say is it was 24 people. So we, we do uh, maybe five or six and get some some feedback and very quickly in an agile fashion implement one or two changes and then test it again and then implement one or two changes and test it again. So really we were making very small incremental changes over a long period of time. But as I said, we got to a point where we were getting the same feedback. We weren't learning anything new. And at that point it didn't matter if it was five or 5,000. We weren't going to learn anything new. So I think in a way it's just a matter of, of um, knowing when to stop and when to put something in. Because nobody has time to test forever, right? I mean, at a certain point, you have to make a decision, right or wrong, and move it forward, and then, you know, cross your fingers. Um, but that's why we do it quickly, because, you know, you cross your fingers, and it blows up, and then you're like, oh, I'm going to redo that. <laughs> do it again, really quick. <laughs> no other questions? Oh, there's someone way in the back. I don't know how, know how much longer I have, but I'll keep it going. Oh, perfect. That's perfect. Thank you. So I guess I'm, wow, that is loud. Good call. Yeah, it's really loud. <laughs> um, some of your strategies for seeing past what the user says they want to finding out like what they really want. Yeah. What thoughts? are those strategies? Oh boy. Um, and this is hard too, right? So I think that um, this is really hard depending on where you work. Obviously at GitLab, we had access, as he said, to thousands of users who are more than willing to, to jump up and give me their, their opinion at any given time, whether I wanted it or not, um, which was fantastic. I welcomed it. Um, my favorite thing was looking at Hacker News, which I don't think many people can say that. But, but it really was, because I think that it, it was a great way to, to really hear what people were experiencing and, and make a difference. But maybe that's not your experience, right? You don't have that, you know, where do you, some, for some people it's where do I find those people to talk to? Um, so, do you work somewhere where you have a, a, a design team, or is it? Not exactly. Not exactly. We work in defense, so. Oh, it's I'm sorry. Like almost no access to the end user. That's a really difficult one. Hmm, that's interesting. Well, I'll tell you what what tools we use, but. I'd be curious to talk to you after and see if we could come up with a way for you to find users, because there's, there's always a way. I think even in defense, there's a way. Um, but so for the user testing, we'd use things like usertesting.com. Um, that, however, I would say we used very sparingly, and I don't know that they use it anymore, because obviously there's a, there's a high, no offense to the normal user, but there's kind of a high technical bar for understanding what you're trying to accomplish in something like GitLab. So you really need actual users to work with it, not just somebody that wants to earn a $10 gift card to Outback or whatever, right? <laughs> so it's really important to have real users. So what we did was we actually created a UX research panel um, and just people could opt in and sign up and we'd send out emails saying, hey, you fit the profile for a research test that we want to do. Are you interested in doing it? Um, and we sometimes people would be entered into a drawing for a card or we just flat out, you know, pay them for their time because sometimes these can take an hour. I mean, it's a long time and then you're being recorded, um, which can be uncomfortable for some people. So that's one way. Another way, honestly, was to do um, surveys. So some things you can get done with surveys, but I've seen some design teams go like survey crazy. Like you can't find out everything with a survey. Um, you can only find out so much. Um, but yeah, and then just doing like uh, desktop sharing. So we do that through a desktop sharing tool. Any, you know, you can sign up for free for any of those. So nothing, nothing high tech, nothing that requires a subscription or anything like that. Um, we didn't do a lot of on-site because GitLab is 100% distributed. So it was a little bit difficult, um, but we did do started, uh, started doing um, customer advisory boards, which is really helpful. Um, and that's where you get, you know, some, some really big stakeholders at some of the bigger companies that maybe have a lot more seats or a lot more licenses or however your, your model works um, and get their feedback. Because obviously, you know, they're probably paying a big chunk and, and their, their feedback is valuable. They're using your product a lot. Um, I think that's it. I don't think I have any other like tools that I can think of off the top of my head, but. That was great, thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Over here. It's gonna make you run around like purposefully all over the place. I probably should have grabbed water and not soda. Like, 
terrified I'm going to belch in front of everyone. So <laughs> apologize ahead of time if that happens. <laughs> uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, do you think any tools uh, or, or techniques you use for UI design can be used for CLI design? where we have the black screen and I just was, commands, commands, commands. I know exactly what you're talking about. I'm so glad that you said that. Um, one of the things that uh, I'm working on right now, so I just started at CloudBees um, about five or six weeks ago, um, and I'm on the Jenkins X team. I don't know if you're familiar. This sounds really loud to me all of a sudden. There we go. Um, and my big project right now is CLI discovery. And, and I can tell you what I'm doing is I started by looking at um, CLI best practices. So in terms of the flags, the, the short flags, the long flags, what are the best practices? Um, looking a lot at the feedback that you give the user. Um, so if they get themselves into a place that, you know, it's going to be really hard to get out of. What kind of feedback are we giving to them? How are we helping the user understand? What kind of help is available? Um, are, we, are we forcing them to go to outer docs, or that, can they just use a, a, a short flag and bring up the help and actually search through and find what they're trying to do? So things like that, I think, um, I'm not doing anything in Sketch. I don't need to sketch anything out. I'm actually going in and um, setting up clusters and, and doing quick starts through RCLI and just kind of having that experience on my own um, and powering through and then seeing where we could make improvements. And I think the big improvements that I see with any CLI is having a beginner and an advanced, right? So um, if you're working with people if you're working with a product and you want to introduce someone to it and you want to make it easy, you don't want to ask them 20,000 questions and ask them to add in all of these commands that they have no idea what they actually do. You want to give them some kind of quick start or some kind of easy setup, happy path to get to that and then have them look at docs or maybe go through a tutorial to understand how to work with it. And if someone's more advanced, then you want to give them the options to fly, right? You don't want to box them into this very opinionated way that they have to set up their cluster or the way that they have to set everything up, you want to give them the freedom to set it up the way that they want and give them access to all the questions, all the bells and whistles. So I think separating those experiences and not making people go through one path is important. Thank you. Uh, would you use, uh, would you analyze uh, values they provide as parameters to adjust defaults, for example? Say that one more time. Uh, would you use uh, values for parameters they provide when they call the CLI to adjust defaults so maybe they don't need to provide those parameters? Again, I think it depends on beginner or advanced. Does that make sense? Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to talk to you more, actually, after this about Thank that. You. Yeah, I'd love, your, I'd love your input. Anybody else? All right, awesome. Um, as always, I tell everyone, um, I, I'm really big on Twitter, um, so I'd love to connect with people on Twitter, find new followers, um, and I, not so big on LinkedIn, but if you're interested uh, in picking my brain about anything UX, design, DevOps related, I'm always happy to chat. Um, so you can connect with me on LinkedIn as well. Thank you so much, everyone.